Naveed, thank you so much for coming on the show or this podcast or event. I'm not really sure what this thing is. I, I think it's a show. Well, uh, but you you being on here certainly up levels it, no matter what it is. Well, I don't know about that, Clint, but it's a pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Yeah. Hey, uh, you're doing some really, really interesting things, which is why I wanted to reach out to you, particularly around art- artificial intelligence, around cancer and heart disease detection. Maybe we start there. Like, how did you figure this out? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And uh, I'll start out by uh, sharing that I, I joke that I'm the black sheep of the family in that uh uh everyone's a doctor except for me <laughs> so my my father is a retired cardiologist my brothers are doctors my, my wife's side, her dad or stepdad or sisters um so i have a law and business background but healthcare has always been in my blood and we had a we have a, a small venture fund here in san diego um and before the current fund um, we had met these scientists, literally rocket scientists at UC San Diego that had done work for NASA and Los Alamos in the past, helping detect anomalies in space weather, which I knew nothing about, but these guys were, you know, what did this for NASA. And so when they came to us, they didn't have a business plan or business model. They just said, hey, we're these AI machine learning experts. And this is back in 2013, um, maybe late 2012, even when we first met them. Um, when it wasn't in the news as much as it is uh, currently. And they said, anywhere you could apply it to make a prediction or recommendation or forecast or to detect anomalies that don't belong in images or data sets, there's an opportunity to make revenue on a business sense or have efficiencies and uh, save money. And we said, well, we're in San Diego. It's a healthcare town. What can we do in healthcare? And in the interest of time, we said, can you detect a breast cancer in a mammogram better than existing computer assisted detection technologies. And they very confidently said, yeah, we can do that. And so that was the genesis of starting uh, the first company, CureMetrics, where now fast forward, we got the first of its kind FDA cleared uh, product um, where we're 99% accurate in detecting breast cancer. Uh, and what we are, uh, knock on wood, close to getting cleared by the FDA. We're just software, we're digital health, but it's a diagnostic, so uh, you have to go through the FDA uh, for this. Um, we found we can also detect heart disease from the same mammogram. So it's a two for one. No um, way, and, wow. And, and, and that's where, not to take away from breast cancer, uh, but heart disease is called a silent killer amongst women. And that 65% of them die on that first heart attack completely asymptomatic where us men tend to have chest pain or shortness of breath. And we go to our doctor and they tell you to eat or exercise and get on a statin and hopefully no surgical procedures needed, but just getting on that statin reduces the risk of a cardiac event by 50 to 60%. Now we get those symptoms, but if women don't, then you hear about them, you know, uh, you know dying at 54 or 58 or 46. And imagine if that woman at the age of 40 or 42 on her first mammogram, not a triathlete, eats well, maybe not great all the time, but in relatively good health, uh, doesn't know of any heart disease in the family. But now in her mammogram, we detect and score the calcification in the arteries, and that leads to her to go to a cardiologist, do an EKG, do a, a bl- blood test, a uh, stress test, and and uh, get on a statin. And now you have a 42-year-old woman that, but for that, um, would not see a cardiologist till a potential heart attack 10 years later, if not earlier, uh, assuming she survives that. So that early detection is huge and calcification builds up in all our bodies, men and women. We just have the ability to detect it from this this existing uh, procedure called a mammogram, right? Which is not comfortable. Women don't love it, needless to say. But if you're going in for no extra radiation, no extra discomfort, it's a two for one. Get your breast cancer screening and also get your breast arterial calcification score. Um, and so that's what we're really, you know, we're really excited about in, in the, uh, you know, delivering better, you know, care for, you know, for, for women's health and, and their families, right? It, it impacts the whole family. Um, if you can impact, uh, if you can detect uh, cancer or heart disease early in a loved one. Yeah. Where do you think we're at at the um, AI for healthcare stage? Do you think we're at the beginning or has this been uh, something that's been working on for a long time and now AI is in the conversation because of chat GPT? I'm just wondering, like, 
uh, where you kind of think we're at there? So that's a really good question. So to peel back the layers on the onion, as they say on that, before getting to healthcare, artificial intelligence has been around for decades, right? Yeah. And it has these fits and starts and it's in the news and then it disappears, right? I think the reason it's sustainable now and it's not going to disappear uh, comes down to the fact that we have uh, uh, more data to process, right? Whether it's Fitbits we wear or iWatches or, you know, any IoT device. And I'm not just talking healthcare, but, uh, you know, a Tesla is an IoT device. It's connected to the Internet. As the engineers say, anything that's connected to the Internet is a node. That node generates data. Well, that data is useless unless you can process it. So we have more data. We have higher compute capacity to process that this gpu capacity that was initially these chips built for video games right that are now processing data in in other capacities and third we have the cloud right whether it's amazon's cloud or microsoft's or oracle's or others but obviously amazon yeah. microsoft being the two big ones so you could process data for much cheaper without having your own data center so we use aws and i could ramp up and process 10 million mammograms tomorrow and ramp it back down and I don't have to have my own hardware. And so this, that's a significant cost saving because you need to train the algorithms and you need this data. And so that's where without AWS, we would not be able to do what we do without significantly more investment in, in, in the hardware. So, so that's where now more data, higher compute capacity, lower cost to process it. And so you have more companies innovating and in developing AI for different capabilities. Now, within healthcare, healthcare is its own animal. Um, and there's regulatory hurdles. We're not just, you know, helping you deliver pizza faster or walk your dog app or a dating app, right? Um, and, and, and as it should be, uh, because it impacts our, our, us uh, at, 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 a, at our healthcare level, it's, it's regulated and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Um, so it takes longer. Now, the law is always gonna be behind technology in any industry, including healthcare. I mean, in cryptocurrencies, right? The law is always behind technology. But I think they're doing a really good job catching up uh, at the FDA and um, in, in the uh, regulatory bodies um, as there's these new technologies coming to market. Uh, and, and so within digital health and augmentative intelligence, as some call it, uh, there, there's uh, more and more products coming to market. And in fact, it was just there's a publication recently of all the FDA cleared products, uh, AI products, and we were on that list, of course. Um, and, the first bite of the apple or the biggest bites of the apple are in the imaging diagnostic space because that data is there and it's digitized mm -hmm. um and and then there's other applications within healthcare that it might take a little longer but there's a lot of work being done around ai for drug discovery uh for uh you know getting clinical trials to market faster um, and we could touch on all that as well in some capacities but um, I, I think historians will look back on this decade in which we're in the earlier part of still, and we're at a huge cornerstone historically. And, uh, you know, we look back in 10 years, modern medicine, uh, I think is going to advance more in the next 10 years than the last 50 years combined. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's, that's so wonderful. That sounds so exciting. What a time to be alive. It, it is indeed. And, um, it, at the end of the day, our body, our DNA is software, it's code, right? Right. And so if we can tap that, all that, all the information is there to say, you know, Clint, based on your molecular makeup, you need these probiotics or you're prone to this disease or ailment. So let's be proactive in your care, right? Or to detect, uh, uh, you know, an anomaly in an image years earlier. Um, I just saw a piece on CNN, an uh, esteemed institution back east, that um, was saying how they, uh, just on for their own personal patients at this clinic, were detecting uh, breast cancer, you know, up to you know, four years earlier, uh, is wow. what they were talking about. Well, we're detecting cancer in some cases six years earlier. So we're getting images from an institution, and they don't tell us what they found, and we not only detect the cancer, but in some cases, we've detected it up to six years earlier. So imagine if just the odds of survival being significantly higher, um, as well as the cost to the healthcare system, which all of our healthcare insurance keeps going up and up and up every year. We're not getting any healthier, right? Yeah. We're paying more. But if you can help deliver better care and reduce wasteful spend and take care of it, you know, ailment or treatment earlier, it costs much less and the odds of surviving are much higher. 
Where are we at with precision, precision uh, medicine? And I'm you, you may have to define this for me because the way I, what I think about is like these really complicated surgeries and AI doing those instead of uh, a human doing those. But uh, where are we with that whole thing? So precision medicine is, uh, it, 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 it's to bring true precision medicine, it has to be based on each single one of us. Each of us, as they say, is an N of one, right? Um, so if God forbid um, everyone in one building had lung cancer, no two cancers are molecularly ever the same. So our co-founder um, at uh, Cure Match, so we have Cure Metrics on the diagnostic side, and Cure Match is uh, the company specific for not just women's health and breast cancer and heart disease, but for any man, woman, or child that has any cancer. What we do on the Cure Match side of the business um, is we take that what's called a next-gen sequencing panel. It's lab work. Uh, I say it's like the 23andMe of that patient-specific cancer. And it's the molecular makeup of the cancer. And uh, Dr. Kurzrock, amazing oncologist, if you look her up, K-U-R-Z-R-O-C-K, how you spell her name for your listeners, um, being Canadian by birth, she always said, cancer is like a snowflake. No two snowflakes ever look the same. So why should this treatment be the same for this patient, this patient, this patient, just because the cancer was found in the same organ of the body, the lung, the liver, right? Because no two are the same. So what we're bringing is true precision medicine, a cure match, because we take that lab work and again, we're digital health. We don't have a lab. We don't want to have a lab. There's other great labs that take that cancer biopsy, blood biopsy, and they'll sequence it. Um, and they'll produce the, literally a 30, 31 page PDF that says this is the molecular makeup of this person's cancer and all the variants and the complexities of it. Some are more complex, some are less. And the more complex there are, the more combinations there are. And so for a three drug combination, for example, there's four and a half million combinations. That's beyond human cognition. I don't care how smart anyone is. You can't process. The human mind cannot process four and a half million combinations. So that's where we come in. We're not replacing the doctor. We're empowering the doctor. And we're uh, in, another arrow in their quiver in this fight against cancer to deliver better care and select the optimal combinations earlier that'll help prolong the life of the patient um, and, and save their life in, in many cases. Um, and so that's where that is true precision medicine based on individual people. Um, and, and so there's a lot being done in that space. Um, and it, it's an exciting time in, in that regard. And uh, in, in one can say precision medicine uh, in, in is, is you know, the eye watch, I, I like to talk about this because it's personal for me, someone very close, uh, detected a, a high resting heartbeat from their watch. And because of that, they went to their oncologist, uh, not oncologist, forgive me, for their, their primary care doctor that sent them a cardiologist and they did EKGs and stress tests and, uh, and it led them to be on heart disease medication that has potentially added decades of life for them. So I think that is precision medicine to a degree, right? Because of that individual person heartbeat and high resting heartbeat when they were just sitting down reading a book um, or having dinner um, that, but for wearing that watch, they didn't feel any different. They wouldn't have known that their heartbeat was higher than it should be just sitting down. Um, so I'll hit pause there. Uh, hopefully that does. No. Good, yeah. That uh, was, that, that's stories. super incredible. You said something really interesting there. Well, you said a couple things. Uh, one, like we have all these devices that are tracking us like, uh, and you wouldn't think of like, maybe like a Tesla being that obviously the Apple watch does the Fitbit, those types of things. Sure. But even my bed tracks me. I have like that eight sleep bet. Like literally everything is, is tracking us at this point and showing like, Hey, you didn't get good night's sleep. Here's what you need right. to do change. Like those types of things. And I think that that advancement may be underrated here in, in the AI discussion, just how much data is being collected on us. You you are so spot on there, Clint. And um, you know, sleep is so important. By the way, and, and uh, I'm someone that I I feel good with six and a half hours sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm trying to, and I track my sleep. I'm trying to get seven hours, right? I'm mm -hmm. trying to get a little bit more. Um, and uh, in that that it it impacts your health, right? And if you don't track it, um, you don't know. And, and so it's, it becomes, there's, you know, the term gamification, right? 
it's almost gamification to be tracking and watching these daily, weekly, monthly trends, whether you're taking more steps or you're burning more calories or you're getting more sleep and a, a lower heartbeat at night. Um, and, it, you know, this is all, um, you know, our, our, our bodies, you know, it's not overnight, you know, one decision, you know, eating that pepperoni pizza is not going to, you know, one slice isn't going to kill you but it adds up, right? And mm -hmm. going on that one run or going to the gym that one time isn't gonna make you healthy forever, but it's a culmination of things. And so to be able to track it, um, I, I think it's going to help you know prolong lives and save lives. And it's not just about, uh, and you, you, you know, we're hearing this more and more, it's not just about living longer chronologically, but having your, uh, uh, chronological age and your biological age right so you could be 59 years old uh but uh you know and doing a genomic test it could say you're it's like you're a 49 year old right yeah and and, and so i don't want to live to 100 and be in nursing home uh i want to live as long as possible and to maybe you know 98 99 years uh and not the last 10 years being you know uh low quality uh so i do think we, we're at that point with, as people are calling it, you know, wellness science, longevity science, and there's more money being put toward it by, of course, the billionaires on down that all want to live forever. Um, so I, I won't go the, down the rabbit hole of living forever, <laughs> but I do think that the person that's going to live to 150 years old uh, is alive right now. Yeah. Um, and, and I do think that we can all live longer. And, and now we do have a blip in the statistics here within these last couple of COVID years, um, as the average lifespan in the US has come down a bit. Um, but um, why? Because people weren't taking care of themselves. They weren't going in for that mammogram because mm -hmm. guess what? Mammography wasn't considered, uh, considered an essential service in 2020. So millions of women didn't get it in 2020 and delayed it until 2021. And um, those that had cancer, you know, they were farther along because of that and yeah the uh, side effects of that um the whole pandemic are like i don't think we fully understand uh, not the, even yeah, yeah. just kind of how uh kind of all the you know various effects that we weren't even thought of at the time that are now kind of when that's a great example people had to put that off for an entire year you put that off for an entire year and that could be the, the difference in everything which is which is really crazy the second thing you said uh, a little bit earlier is you said like the AI is not going to replace the doctor. Yeah. Um, it's going to like enhance their experience. And and this is kind of like, it, as you look at like all these news articles about AI, you know, AI kind of being like the buzzy topic over the past few months, um, the concern and the worry of many people is like, Hey, this is going to replace a lot of jobs. Um, what is your uh, take on that? So I, I love that question. And I've, I've uh, needless to say, you know, had it over the years um i'll take it back to you know when the automobile was invented you had so many people that said you know what's this going to do to all the people taking care of the horses and the buggies and the horseshoes and they're going to lose their jobs and guess what they did but look at all the jobs that were created because of the automobile at the factories at the gas stations at the oil companies at the you know the mechanics uh the the, the you name it anything that goes with the automobile, um, it, it's created, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of jobs that were not anticipated, right? And if you go to the, you know, turn of the century, in, you know, the 2000s, I mean, there was no Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or, you know, Google to the stage, maybe they had started right around then, but, you know, all these tech companies, LinkedIn, they didn't exist. And look at all the jobs they've created, Zoom, right? That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, we're not on Zoom at this moment, I, uh, but it's, so jobs get created and they're higher paying jobs in many cases. So yes, AI will replace some jobs. Uh, maybe we won't need as many, uh, you know, taxi drivers or truck drivers, or maybe we don't need as many lawyers, not right, not to get a lawyer joke in there, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but, um, but the ones that are there will be higher paying jobs and there'll be jobs created you know, to stick with the automobile example, you're going to need someone with a PhD in AI ethics to train the algorithms and, and the Ford Motor Company or GM or Toyota uh, what to do in 10,001 different scenarios, right? Um, because if 
you're driving in your car and your daughter's next to you and there's a truck that's about to hit you and it's most certainly going to kill both of you um, and there's a car in front of you there's pedestrians to the left um a car behind you as a human you know again not to get into the ethics of it but as a human you're you're, you're going to want to live you're going to crank to the mm-hmm. left and you might hit some pedestrians um and there might be lawsuits from that and and you you have insurance and horrible right to give you that analogy but as ford motor company if you're training the algorithm for that driverless car if they they what do they do i mean this is an ethical question do, yeah that's do way make, interesting do they make that automobile that's driverless and you and your daughter or son or a relative or loved one or friend are sitting in it do they make that veer into the pedestrians because if they do, now it's Ford Motor Company that's going to get sued, um, and they're deeper pockets than an individual, right? And so that's just one example of of all the jobs that are going to be created um, that we can't even imagine. Um, and the lawyers are never going to go away, by the way. Needless to say, that <laughs> uh, they're, they're going to be uh, right in there in, in drafting these laws. And, and the law is always behind technology, by the way, whether it's in healthcare or in driverless cars or cryptocurrency. So the law is always going to be catching up to technology because um, first the technology comes out and then there's a problem that needs a solution and, you know, guardrails on the freeway, so, so to speak. Yeah, that the yeah th- those are super interesting, complex questions uh, that are going to be, uh, you know, how do you answer those? That's, that's, that's wild. <laughs> It, it, it's, we, I mean, we live on truly, you know, I think historic, interesting times, not that, any any time probably isn't interesting that you know, people are living in, but um, I, I do think in the uh, you know to get philosophical with it in the history of human evolution and uh, is that you know it, it's looked back upon um, this century and you know this ten years here the twenty twenty to twenty thirty it's going to be historic um, and some good and some bad at the end of the day the automobile is not good or evil. Yeah, so many people have lost their lives because of an automobile accident, right? But there's been and, and there's you could say pollution and smog and this and so many bad things. But there's the good is immeasurable, right? Mm-hmm. And AI is it's just a technology. It's not good or evil. It will it will certainly there will be bad actors that will use it for bad purposes. And so our job as a society and in a country, uh, and I I do think there's a national security component of this is to be able to mitigate and stop the bad actors um, while there are incredible good uses of the technology uh, to improve all our lives. You also have an AI fund. So what do you look for in a company or startup uh, when you're investing in them? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And that's that's really how you know we first started investing in uh, software companies and you know then companies applying some AI applications and being based here in San Diego, uh, UC San Diego in our backyard is really one of the epicenters, one of the birthplaces of artificial intelligence, you know, harkening back to the beginning of the university. Um, and, and so we, we're around it, right? It's in our ecosystem. Um, and, and so we, we just meet really brilliant, smart people that come from all over the world to come here and get their PhDs and their masters and, mm-hmm. and, and artificial intelligence and the data sciences. Um, and, and so we started investing in them um, and meeting uh the people and I, I always say that uh you know you don't have to be a, a data scientist you don't have to be technical to understand or benefit from artificial intelligence in your career um because you also have to just there's a strategic value so if you're a real estate agent or an accountant uh, or an interior designer or an architect um you don't need to be an ai expert but to stay ahead of the competition uh, or, or to keep pace, you need to know and become educated on how AI can be used in your industry to, again, help make a detection, a prediction, a forecast, detect anomalies that don't belong in data sets um, that are going to bring efficiencies and are going to increase revenues. Um, and so that's what we look for at a startup. We look at whether uh, it's in healthcare or it's a uh, sales enable- enablement product or advertising or applying to the financial markets um, or, you know, industrial automation and the IOT devices that need, you know, maintenance and to detect something before it breaks down. Um, we, we look, 
do do they have domain expertise in this field? Um, do, and then is there enough data to train the algorithms? How do you get that data? Um, and then you know, do they have the technical expertise, the AI expertise, the data science expertise to then take advantage and unlock value from that data? And it doesn't matter if they if they don't, is if they're the domain expert, we could then bring the AI component and the expertise from our team and our bench and, and those that we know. And that's how we ended up starting Cure Match and Cure Metrics, right? Dr. Mm. Kurzrock is an amazing lady. Um, and uh, as we're having this conversation on International Women's Day, I think is, is today and uh, you know, hats off to, to all women and, and you know, with, with, with her as our partner here, uh, truly one of the top oncologists in the world. And her passion is seeing patients and doing research. She would have never created Cure Match on her own. And so when we met her and we saw the amazing work she was doing for cancer patients that were being transferred to Morris Cancer Center when she was here in San Diego, that were on their deathbeds in many cases that ended up, some cases, you know, if, if not being cured, living much, much longer. We said, look, there's, let's build something here because you're one person. You could only see so many patients in a day in your lifetime. Let's build something that could be of benefit to doctors and patients and pharma companies at, at, at a global level to impact more lives. And so we married her domain expertise, we brought the AI expertise, we brought the clinical expertise from our uh, chief science officer and, and the clinical team she's built there. And that's where the company came from. Um, and, and so we, whether we're starting a company like that and putting in the first money, um, or we're looking at an existing company that uh, has already put some of those pieces together and we look to see, can we be helpful? Um, or are we just money uh, to, to help fuel them to go faster? Why had you choose to be based in San Diego? Uh, there's a saying, happy wife, happy life. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's what I thought. So, well, I, it's I, the most I, beautiful city in the world, too. It's just so beautiful. Uh, look, I love it here. It's apples and oranges. I love the mountains and, yeah. and you know, getting up to Montana and Utah and Idaho. And uh, it's great to visit Florida and the East Coast. Every, you know, there's beautiful parts all over. But uh, I came to San Diego to go to college. And, and then I met my wife in grad school. And she was from here. And. Um, and so we ended up settling down here and the rest is kind of history. Yeah. You know, something I've been thinking about as, as it pertains to AI is like whether like a lot of people are now saying like, Hey, this is going to be as big, if not bigger than the internet. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we move forward here as a society, kind of what comes out of that, what does that mean? What type of opportunities are uh, created inside of this? And I wonder like, you know, when we were in like the nineties, the big companies could be so easily disrupted, right? Because they were slow and bulky and like they, they didn't believe maybe that the internet or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And it seems like we're not in that position today. It seems like the big companies are very aware of, of AI. So how do you think of that? That's So that's a loaded question. There's so much to yeah. get into there. I mean, some examples from the past. I mean, you know, Microsoft wouldn't be here if IBM... Uh, didn't brush them off, right? They're mm -hmm. the operating system too, I think, at IBM. And and um, it, I, I think, I don't know the full history, but you know, Microsoft may not be here if IBM took advantage of it. Or Xerox, everyone knows that, you know, Steve Jobs at Apple saw the, that first Macintosh or uh, kind of the, 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 the idea of it at Xerox in one of their labs. But Xerox was, no, we're, you know, that's not what we do. And, um, and so, they they went by the wayside, you know, Blockbuster and uh, Netflix, yeah. right? It was back in 2007 or eight, uh, the famous earnings call with the CEO of Blockbuster. And I think one of the analysts asked him, you know, what do you think of competitors like, you know, uh, what is it, Red Redbox or am mm -hmm. I saying yes, or, in, or uh, Netflix? And he scoffed. I remember listening to it. the guy literally scoffed and said, oh, they're not competition. People like to come into the Blockbuster store and in an experience and they like to come in with their boyfriend and girlfriend or spouse and pick something out and get a bag of popcorn. It was, and he, <laughs> you know, needless to say, uh, Netflix got the last laugh. And they even toyed with them, I think. And Netflix at the time spent the last few pennies they had to fly to Blockbuster headquarters. And the Blockbuster folks did it just to, you know, needle them. And, um, and, and so, you know, the rest is history. I think at the present day, you have these huge companies, Google, Amazon, you know, uh, you could say Facebook and um, and 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 the others, uh, 
and there is a consolidation happening, right? That they they end up buying and acquiring smaller companies or even public companies that are smaller and they roll them up. And there's even a concern that they're hiring PhD students before they finish their PhDs. Mm -hmm. And so the problem then becomes, well, who's going to be the PhD that's going to teach future students, right? And so this is this is a challenge. They throw you know throw so much money at someone, and they're like, forget the PhD. I'm I'm going to go work at Google, right? Um, and, and so I think there's the beauty of capitalism is that the pendulum swings. So right now you see in the news, and are we in a recession? Are we going to be in one? How bad will it be? And, you know, all all this talk. You're seeing the tech companies. You know, they're doing layoffs, and those people that are getting laid off. Some of them might go work in another big company, but some of them might say, you know what, I have that idea to go start a company and I'm going to go do that. Or my friend had started a company. I'm going to go join that private company. And so that kind of like the burning of the forest creates then the nutrients for the new forest to arise. And, and, um, and, and so I think there's always going to be that innovation and that pendulum swinging. Um, and there will be new companies. There will be uh, it, and the big, you know, Amazon does an amazing job at innovating and they, they operate almost like a startup. They have something I call, uh, no team within Amazon is bigger than a two pizza team. I think they call it. So you could feed the whole team with two boxes of pizza and they really run Amazon as a startup in that way, uh, to maintain that mm -hmm. competitive advantage and, and not become a big bureaucracy, um, and, and, and to keep that edge. But, you know, that people then leave Amazon and they can go somewhere else and they could bring that same type of culture and notion. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's a challenge, um, but uh, the pendulum always swings. And, you, you know, we're going to have amazing companies built in a downturn. Uh, sometimes I say the best companies are built in the downturns. And, um, you know, the next Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazons are being built right now. The one that I think is particularly interesting f for your industry and medical tech and AI med medicine, all that type of stuff is Apple. It seems like Apple has like with, with the watch and kind of all their various like Apple fitness, Apple health, all these, these, these various things. It seems like they're going to be a major player in this, right? They, they are. And I mean, look, healthcare is 20% of the U S economy. Right. And so, you have all the tech companies looking to get a piece of that pie uh, from Apple to Amazon. Uh, yeah, Amazon's another big one. And they're, they're ending up, you know, with COVID, you know, for better or for worse, sped up digital health by three, if not five years. Because now, like, people see that telehealth works. You don't need to go to your doctor. You can see them from your laptop, when, just like you and I are doing right now for a lot of procedures. And, and so now there's efficiencies that come with that. Um, and people might be prone to get a diagnosis for, let's say, sleep apnea because they could do it at home instead of going into a center. And they're going to end up living longer because of that. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's all these offshoots. But, yeah, absolutely. Apple, App, uh, Amazon, they're all spending a ton of money, um, you know, robot, hiring doctors. Right. Uh, bringing in insurance industry experts. Um, you have companies like CVS, your traditional, you know, pharma retailer that, you know, they they a couple of years ago they bought Aetna, right? So now they're an insurance company. And 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 so we're gonna go toward this value-based care system um where it's you don't get paid, a doctor doesn't get paid fee for service, but it's delivering value and helping someone improve an ailment or symptom or uh, have a positive result. Um and and that's gonna need a lot of technology. And so um all all these companies are are looking to you know you know, crack and chip the system, you know, get in the healthcare system is very regulated and we have incredible infrastructure in good and bad ways. Um, but it's happening. I mean, Oracle bought Cerner, right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and, uh, is getting into healthcare that way. And they want to, of course, bring them their Oracle cloud to compete with Amazon's cloud and Microsoft's. Um, uh, but, um, I, I think that, uh, the delicate balance we'll have to strike with ourselves as individuals is, um, our privacy, right? How much information yeah. do you want Apple to have on you? And then what if Apple owns an insurance company? Will they be able to use that to charge you more or less for your health insurance, right? Um, to say, you know, you slept six and a half hours instead of eight hours, we're going to, you know, charge you more for your insurance. And 
Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's there's going to be Yeah, we're going to get into a lot stuff. of weird yeah. ethical questions for sure. Like even like Amazon getting in the prescription drug business. Amazon yeah. knows everything there is to know about me, right? Like, and, uh, you know, if I start getting my prescription drugs from them, now they know all my health stuff too, like ailments, things like that. that that's that's kind of crazy. Well, it, it is. And so this whole direct to consumer approach is happening. Um, and the healthcare system or, you know, they'll go kicking and screaming to try to avoid that. Right. But yeah. uh, the efficiencies will come from as much direct to consumer as possible. And Amazon is absolutely trying to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, with, you know, all of us if we're Amazon prime members, you know, what else can be offered to us? Right. And in Clint, we, we know which probiotics you ordered last month and we know you didn't sleep enough and mm -hmm. we have an insurance company and we're going to charge you more if you don't take that medicine tomorrow. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it, it gets into some interesting dynamics, but uh, it, it's uh, I think at the end of the day um, we have to balance the privacy uh, factors. And I, I'd say we're in the middle between China and Europe, Europe mm -hmm. with GDPR is, you know, privacy is an even bigger deal in China. You know, what's privacy. Yeah. And, you know, they'll use, you know, patient's information there. And, and by the way, they'll have a competitive advantage in some ways because they don't have to worry about HIPAA and things like that. Mm -hmm. They'll just take your information and train their algorithms to detect things and come up with technologies that'll benefit people in China. And, you know, what? guess what? They, they might develop something that benefits us, too. But it's an ethical question. Um, and so we're kind of in the middle, I would say, between China and Europe in regards to, you know, where we fall on privacy. And it's a delicate balance to strike. Yeah, for sure. Finally, I'll let you go because I want to be respectful of your time. But um, what are you most excited about? The end of this decade, we get to 2030. What do you think like uh, is something that's going to be we're going to look at um, or think now? Like, I can't even believe that happened. So um, I was asked recently of something uh, along the lines of uh, what's a headline you think we'll see in 2030? And I said, I think it'd be pretty amazing to say uh average lifespan is 100 years and the first person has lived to 150. And that sounds crazy, but maybe it's not 2030, but it's, you know, maybe 2035. And I, I, I think that um, we're all going to, you know, live much longer and higher quality lives. And, uh, and it's a matter of, you know, what are we going to do with that extra time, right? And yeah. uh, are we going to use it efficiently or we... Uh, I, I think it's 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 an amazing time, and uh, uh, I'm personally very excited about it. And um, I, th I think for for us, you know, what gets us up every day is um, to say, okay, if, if we can do things even one day faster, we're going to impact someone's life. And um, whether it's to detect breast cancer and heart disease earlier in women, or it's to recommend the best combination of drugs for a lung cancer patient with our cure match technology, or it's to help one of the pharma companies get a clinical trial to market faster so that um, not only can people benefit faster, but at the end of the day, you have to follow the money. The pharma company wants to make money. And mm -hmm. if you help them make money faster, they get a drug to market faster and FDA cleared faster, then you know there are gonna be people that will benefit from that cancer drug uh, that but for that earlier uh, approval would not. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's crazy. Naveed, thank you so much for coming on. We got to have you on again. Uh, I can talk to you forever on this stuff. This is very cool. Thank, thank you, Quinn. No, it's uh, been a pleasure, and uh, I have a lot of fun talking about uh, uh, this. So I appreciate the time. Yeah, congrats on everything you're doing. We'll, we'll catch you down the road. Thanks so much. Take care. You bet.